Uh, thank you, Isabel, Livia, and Julio. That was fascinating, and I'm glad that we got a chance to hear you speak. I'm glad everyone had a chance to listen. Um, I'm sure we all learned a lot from that. So, next, we're going to go into luxury. For our next talk, we're going to focus on the luxury goods industry, which is worth half a trillion dollars a year in revenue. Our next company has been the stalwart of the industry uh, for over a century, in fact, 123 years. Great-great-granddaughter of the original founder, Nadia Swarovski, is a member of the executive board of the company. She is here to tell us how strategizing has been the key to their continued success. You, our wonderful audience, can also ask Nadia questions via our Web Summit app. Um, they'll be put to her by our moderator. So let's get started um, in a conversation with Mima Viglazzi, uh, editor of Show Studio. Please welcome Nadia Swarovski. Girl, you sit there. Mm. I'm too far here. Can yes. I sit with you? <laughs> Since we're here on the wonderful fireside conversation. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Very so, intimate. Nadia, this is about a brand that has been going for many, many years. So it's about longevity. So before going into the future, I would like to talk a little bit about your heritage. So you were born as Swarovski. Uh, with a family, you know, very much involved. Your father has been involved and your grandfather and great-grandfather. So can you tell us a little bit what that meant ever since you were a child? Well, I have to say, in a certain sense, one can say it was a blessing, but it was also a curse to be born into that family with that name. Um, I am from Tyrol, from um, a little town called Wattens, which is outside of Innsbruck, and Swarovski was really the, one of the biggest employers of the region. So as you can imagine, as a four-year-old girl, and in then school. eventually a girl in kindergarten and then in grade school, it was not necessarily perceived with tremendous happiness to have a Swarovski sitting there in the classroom. So to me, it was quite frankly a disadvantage. Mm. But did you know from immediately that you were going to work there? Was did it in your destiny? Um, I feel it was in my destiny. Um, you know, I grew up right next to the factory, so looking out of my bedroom window, I would see the big Swarovski sign. I, I feel like I have Swarovski branded on my forehead. But what was so fascinating for me is to really um, be taken along into the factory with my father, with my grandfather. You know, they would just, you know, it was just commonplace for them to show me the, the machines, um, talk to the factory workers. And it was really their passion. And as a child, to see the passion an engineer has towards his machines was really so impactful. Oh, that's um, good. I always felt it was very important for me to find my own path mm. um, and never, ever rely on the family business as a job opportunity. So I found myself um, in the world of art history and art and eventually figured out what my aha moment was and what I as an individual could contribute to this family business. And then so one day you decided I'm ready. And then how does it work? You just go back home and you say, I want to roll. I mean, you're so many. I know that there are so many Swarovskis in the company. So then well, what father, happened then? My father certainly wanted me to study engineering. And of course, off I went to study art history. Um, I was at Sotheby's, then it was at Gagosian Gallery. Found myself in New York City, which I think is a fantastic school for work. You know, it really sets your professional bar very high. The working ethic of the New Yorkers are fantastic. And um, it was really there that I was working with European fashion brands that were also family businesses. Yeah. So I was working with the Missoni family, Trussardi, Valentino, and I thought, well, wait a minute. I actually 
have a family business with its roots in fashion, but nobody knows about it. And this was at a time when people were really associating Swarovski with the figurines, the crystal figurines. And this is where the stories of my grandfather would come back to mind, you know, stories of my grandfather working with Coco Chanel and Christian Dior. And I thought, okay, this is it. I am stepping back into that family business. And my intention was to find my grandfather's Christian Dior. And that person ended up being Alexander McQueen. Yes, well, sorry, I interrupt you, but because I just want the audience to understand, Nadia is certainly recognized to be the one who brought Swarovski back into the radar, in a way, by starting collaborations with top designers. But not only big brands like the Armani that everybody knew, but the Alexander McQueens, you know, the upcoming designer that were changing the fashion world, the fashion ideas, and so enters the collaboration. So you went back to the family, you said we need to go back and be, you know, recognized as a player in the fashion industry, and you invented the collaboration, right? Uh, reintroduced the collaboration, yeah. you know, after everything I've done, I've just, I've watched my forefathers, and um, yes, I did make the proposal, and it was actually appreciated, but I think the expectations that it would also bring a financial return wasn't necessarily there. And I think that's what really got everyone's attention. And, you know, it was another realization that in Austria we we're creating such an amazingly crafted, engineering crafted product that is such a crucial part and creative ingredient to a designer's overall design vision. So the designers, um, as you say, your, your, your grandfather, it, it was there, but they didn't really, what, what were they using when they went, wanted sequins or crystals in their fashion? Where were they going you know, I before finding out what you could do for them? We, w w they didn't use crystal. So the designers, you know, crystal was very much used in the 50s, 60s, 70s, then it kind of pivoted off in the 80s. And so we tried to reintroduce ourselves in the 90s. And um, what was so important, I, I personally felt that crystal was misused in so many design examples. So I thought as a supplier to this industry, it was very important to demonstrate a very beautiful and effective way of using crystal within fashion. So actually, Mima, when we're choosing our designers, we're choosing them very selectively and carefully. We choose designers of whom we know will not disappoint us in terms of their creative vision. And then another thing that's so important for us is we celebrate the designers. We celebrate them, we promote them. We want to encourage them uh, to grow and, and show their ultimate creative expression, which at the same time then boomerangs back to us as a brand demonstrating how the product can be used. So it was a very that's symbiotic amazing. situation. But so when you say we don't want them to disappoint us, it means that you need designers that will understand the same care for crafts, for quality, yes or that Absolutely. they big success financially? I mean, I what's think, the... I think when the first element is secured, then the big financial success follows. And um, that's why, you know, we really, it's important for us to work with people who have the consideration for craft and the appreciation of materials. So we're actually working very closely with design schools nowadays. Mm. And, you know, in the design schools, certainly the students are taught to use with metals, fabrics, um, leathers and so on, and, and crystal is yet one more material for them to work with. But the knowledge of using crystal in the right way is absolutely crucial to use it successfully. Okay, and do they come to Vattens and they see the possibility, because I've been there and I've seen what you guys do and the thousands of possibilities that are given for creativity. Do they come and are trained about crystals yes. and well, what they can do with it? Certainly we try to do that now, but um, Vatens is so far away, you know, as I mentioned, it's in the Tyrolean Alps and was not the easiest place to get to. So therefore we have set up showrooms, certainly in all the fashion centers mm. of the world. So New York, Paris, Milan, Los Angeles, we're in Asia. And we have actually started this concept of it's, it's kind of like the Chinese apothecary. You know, we have many, many hundreds of little drawers filled with different crystals. And um, overall, we have about 350,000 uh, different types of crystals from shape, size, wow. type of application. And we just felt it's so important to have our own showrooms to show the designers what they can play with um, versus going to visit the designers. With. And nowadays, people are coming to visit us in Austria. And 
we found that that's important because um, people are getting a, an essence and a sense for Swarovski. They see the big manufacturing play, plant, they realize how large it is, but they also see the beautiful environment that we're from. And sustainability certainly is a major, major driver for Swarovski. Yeah, we're going to get into that in depth. But before, I would like to talk about technology. So. To, to be still relevant today and to be so successful for so many years, you need to innovate. And I know you just reopened a uh, manufacturer. That's right. So can, can you give us a little yes. bit so of info about So we did uh, that? reopen a manufacturing plant in Austria. It's a big hall, which is actually LEED certified. It was created by Sonetta, the architect. And again, it's totally in our ethos, in our DNA, to like reflect our architecture now, also um, supporting the sustainability. But um, we have now showcased some of our machines. In the past, it was a really top, top secret process, how we make the crystal and how we cut it. However, we are showing our customers various different machines, um, and we're showing them in particular the cutting process. Um, and we now have a, we've integrated a process where we can turn around prototypes for designers in 18 hours. Okay. So they come sit with our in-house technicians, create sketches, and within 18 hours they have their prototypes ready to go on the catwalk. Which means the shape they want or the color they want, Absolutely. the size they want. Exactly. And it really fits right in, the, in line with the customization um, and really uh, the bespoke creation of crystals for the designers. I'm, I'm going to step back because many people ask me, what's a crystal? Is it organic, natural? Is it made, man-made? Can we say that or it's a secret? It is man-made. And I okay. have to say, I have to tell there you, I'm we so go. proud of it because when I started my career at Swarovski in New York City, I, w I got, quite frankly, a lot of pushback from the diamond industry who always considered crystal as the lesser valued material yeah. compared to diamonds. And then I would always say, well, do you know how a crystal is made? It's so hard to make a crystal. I mean, there were a hundred different chemical ingredients, first of all, put together, which are melted into glass. And then the glass is formed into various different molds, and then eventually it's cut. So the process is very tedious, and it's amazing to see the cutting machines. So for example, the smallest crystal we make is less than a millimeter, and it's made by a machine that weighs 35 tons. So just the concept of having such a heavy machine create such a small crystal to me is, in terms of engineering, a huge feat. Yeah. So that is why we actually wanted our customers to understand a little bit how hard the um, engineering is and the manufacturing in order to appreciate the material itself. But I also know but that it is man-made. I also and know that, that you're going into man-made, man-imitating nature, so into sustainable diamonds, right? Yes. Did I say it correctly? The it is What's lab the creative grown, diamond? Lab-grown diamonds. Okay. Can you explain a little bit that? Yes. So, you know, as Swarovski, we really appreciate ourselves as, or we see ourselves as master cutters. Uh, because we've really had such a big push into sustainability, we thought an area to really embrace is the fine jewelry industry, in particular playing with created diamonds or lab-grown diamonds. Um, it is a fascinating process to see how the lab-grown diamonds are made. There are two different processes. One is vapor deposition. The other one is really um, implementing pressure and heat. Mm. Again, a fantastic chemical engineering process. But we just felt there's so many people out there that are informed about di how diamonds are actually mined and might not necessarily appreciate that process. And it's for that customer we just wanted to give the more sustainable solution. Um, I certainly hope by and I'm sure everyone here has heard about the emergence of the created diamonds and how so many more companies are now making them, companies in California, China, and so on. It's put a very positive pressure on the mining industry in general because, yes, diamonds and j stones in general can be mined in a sustainable way that protects the, pli the planet and people. Yeah. It does require, however, the financial and time investment, which ever so often companies are not ready to invest. But so are you also going into mining in a sustainable way on top of producing yes. or diamonds in a lab? What we are going into is we are, we are buying from mines that, have sustainable. that are sustainable, exactly. And we work closely with GIA, the Gemological Institute yeah. of America, and they're certainly recommending uh, those mines to us. 
That's great. And yeah, and it's so it's very important to know that Swarovski, not only they're very successful commercially, I think the biggest jeweler in the world as far as custom jewelry or whatever we call it. But anyway, but they also trying to give back a lot. So not only Swarovski has a foundation, the Swarovski Foundation, that I would like to talk about a little bit, but also a water school, mm -hmm. which I think it's a very interesting theme. Can you tell us a little bit about the water okay, school? Okay, so, you know, the water school, first of all, we just um, recognize that water will be one of the most cherished commodities in the future because we come from this environment. I mean, Daniel Swarovski came from Bohemia um, originally, which was indigenous to crystal cutting, and he chose this l little town in Tyrol to build his factory. Why? Because of the water power that came out of the mountain. Okay. So he instantly used water um, in hydroelectricity to power his machines. So water has always been dear to us. Um, water is used tremendously for the cutting process in particular. We recycle that water, we reuse that water. Um, but it really, and what we've also noticed living in Tyrol is the melting of the glaciers, um, the flooding of some of the rivers and lakes. So um, we therefore have cast our eye on creating this water school first in Austria. Now we have water school in India, China, South America, North America. Uh, there the program actually teaches teachers how to teach children about the various different topics related to water, whether it's hygiene related, scarcity related, um, and just in general, the handling of water. That's very good. And uh, we're so excited that we worked with the UCLA School of um, Theater, Film and Television on a documentary, which is on Netflix. It's called Water School. Um, and UCLA felt very strong to actually focus in on women and girls because they're so tremendously affected by water issues, in particular in third world countries. Yeah, it's a very inspiring film because you see actually the children explaining what they learned right. and how they then connected in their countries with other issues and problems. And here we can introduce the Swarovski Foundation, which takes care of many other issues in the world, right? right? No, absolutely. The foundation really is an extension of what Swarovski does in so many regards. And we focus on water, we focus on design, we focus on women. We just felt those are the areas that create a common denominator across the board, what we do in all the countries that we work in. Yeah. And as we are, we feel, we're focusing on strong communication to our customers with our product. We felt, my gosh, we have active listeners and let's just engage them in all the topics that we're working on and trying to improve globally. And now, do you think that longevity is linked to that? Do you think that today to be relevant in the long term, uh, especially a family company with a name that is so well known, needs to be sustainable and ethical and, and to give back? Absolutely. Was that your idea? Well, you know what? It's certainly family values, family values being reflected in the work, you know? Again, I come from a family of hardcore engineers and engineering is as straightforward as it can get. You know, it's very black and white. It's very pure. It's very honest. And we have such a strict quality control. Not one crystal leaves the factory with a scratch on it or a bubble in it. You know, that to me is such honesty. Um, our product is a lens that captures the light and refracts the light. It's something so positive. And those are values that are really kind of also permeating through um, what we're doing. I mean, we create a product that brings joy to people. Mm. And with that, you know, 90% of our customers are women and we're grateful to our customers. And our thinking was, how can we give back to our customers? And therefore the foundation and therefore all the initiatives of, you know. Um, to give back. So absolutely. And there's a huge amount of question coming in and I, we have two minutes, so I need to ask at least one. Um, how do you choose your brand ambassadors? Example, Carly Kloss. How do we choose them? Yeah, how do you choose your yeah. ambassadors? So Carly Kloss was a brand ambassador. Now the new brand ambassador coming out is uh, Penelope Cruz. We certainly choose uh, these ambassadors for their substance, for what they stand for. Carly is a top model. She is beautiful, but guess what? She is such an amazing person. And I certainly appreciate all her charitable giving, her giving back. It's been fascinating to watch Carly on set, behind the scenes, you know, when she's working with the cast to get her ready for the camera. And she is the nicest person. So and that's important. I really think, I so believe in that. And I believe that kind of work really permeates out beyond the image, you know. Um, I see her as a role model for our customer. The next one is Penelope Cruz. She's such an amazing person. And she actually, 
was so excited about our Create a Diamond um, project that she asked if she could create a line for us. And of course, we so could, she could not... So she actually designed the line? Yes, absolutely. And she so did? We really? She did. And um, we're so excited because she really designed that, having herself on the red carpet in mind. But she feels so strongly about doing whatever one can do now, whatever we all need to do now to save the planet. And you know, be more sustainable and be more conscious and considerate. So, you know, to have Penelope as a spokesperson is incredibly important. Authentic collaboration. Yes. Uh, we've got 30 seconds, so I'm not sure I can... Um, how do you stay relevant in the digital area, era? I think um, storytelling is so important, certainly in terms of technology, digitalization, we have to modernize, we have to um, embrace the changes, we have to communicate in that um, way, but what we communicate is so important. And I think relevance really is given by, by telling good stories. That's great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mima. Thank you all. Great. Where was I?